measure just about everything. It's simply how we work. We've always been pattern seekers, data consumers. It's part of how we got here. It's part of what sets us apart from everything else. Whether we do it for necessity, for progress, or just for fun, everyone does it. We humans measure every important thing in our life. So why would our spiritual lives be any different? So metrics, measurements that matter, and the question, why not in our spiritual lives? And the answer is, we should. We should be looking at our spiritual lives and taking them not, not as seriously as every other area, but more seriously. Because nothing matters more. Nothing impacts all the other parts of our lives like our spiritual life does. And so we're going to be talking in these coming seven weeks about how to look and measure our spiritual lives. But, and, and we have to acknowledge that this is just part of what we do as human beings. I mean, think about it. In an aircraft, I've got to, I've got to fly right seat, which means I've been in, been in a jet where I got to be in the right seat, which means I got to do nothing but keep my hands off stuff. And watch, but, uh, but watching all of, the, all of the dials and all the different things, and you go, well, do those really matter? Well, when you're flying a plane, does your altitude matter? Yes. yes. Does your speed matter? Yes. All those things matter. And if you ignore them, you have a chance of doing what? Crashing, Crashing and most probably? Burning. Bur burning. I was going to say dying, but burning. Okay, you can get morbid. Um, <laughs> I got a couple, but, but the point is, it matters. It matters. And the times I've flown right seat and watched, the person flying the plane is watching every detail because they matter. We measure height of children. We kind of watch their growth and where they're at, and we track that because we want to see forward progression because, because it matters. If you go see a doctor, they're going to check your heartbeat, and they're watching for certain patterns and certain strength because if you don't, if your heart stops beating, you die. Not burn. Settle down. Uh, you, just, you just you die, Right? We, you, you watch the temperature in your car. If that light goes red, if it's in the red too long and we ignore it, at some point the engine blows. The car stops working. Why? Because it matters. The measurement's there to warn you and let you know what's going on. In sports, there's a measurement of every single detail. We're kind of in Olympic season right now. And, and, you know, and there's people that will win races by hundredths of a second. And it's going to depend on how tight the clothing was, the right helmet, the right... I mean, every detail matters, and they're measuring those things because those measurements matter to get to the goal that they want to accomplish. A lot of people wear Fitbits, something that tracks their sleep and that tracks their steps and all kinds of things because we, we, we want to be healthy. It matters to us. There's even now things like Bible apps where we're starting to kind of hedge into that spiritual world where people are saying, I'm going to track how I'm doing with my Bible reading. You know, you say, well, how are you doing with reading your Bible? Well, I do pretty good. And then they check their app. Oh, I guess three times this month. Maybe that's not as good as I thought, you know? Does it matter that we measure our spiritual lives? And the answer is yes. And so for the next seven weeks, we're going to be talking about different aspects of what we measure, what we should be measuring as Christians if we want to grow into maturity, if we want to go somewhere and stay healthy and strong in our journey with Jesus. And today we're beginning by talking about, and this is critical, looking at and measuring if I have Jesus-like character, if I have Jesus-like character, am I becoming a person that looks like and thinks like and sounds like and acts like Jesus? Is my character, who I am on the inside, transforming my outside because I'm becoming more like Jesus? So, so why start with Jesus-like character as the first area to measure? Why not start with Bible study or prayer or Sunday attendance? Because if we don't get this one right, all the other ones don't matter. We need to measure Christ-like character first. So why measure this? Number one, and if, if you're a note taker, uh, you, you, can, you can jot this down, but why should we measure our growth in Jesus-like character? Number one, because God cares about who we are becoming. The biblical term is sanctification. The theological term is to be sanctified. God cares that you're growing spiritually. God doesn't just want us to be converts to a religious system. He wants to grow mature in being like Jesus. It matters to God. I mean, think about this. After Jesus died on the cross, 
He was buried in the ground. He rose again in glory for our sins, paid the price, broke the power of hell and death and Satan, rose, and then before Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave instructions to his followers. This is one of those moments of instruction. Matthew 18, 19. Jesus says to his followers, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't say make converts. Converts say, well, I believe, with, I believe with your, your, your system. I agree with your system. But disciples are people that are growing to be like Jesus. It's a journey of growth. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This challenging journey of learning all that Jesus has taught, we can know that Jesus is with us. He's helping us. But Jesus said, here's the, here's the bottom line. I want people to not just be converts to Christianity, doing religious stuff. I want them to grow into maturity as my followers, as disciples of Jesus. Ephesians 4.13, the Apostle Paul is dealing with this issue of spiritual growth and kind of as the capstone as he's sort of digging into this, this conversation, but he kind of hits the high point of what he's teaching about becoming like Jesus. And here's what he says in 4, chapter 4.13 of Ephesians. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal. That you and I would attain, would grow to, would move to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Are you there yet? I'll tell you the answer. No. If you think the answer is yes, ask the person next to you. Uh, they'll tell you, you still got a little growing. You still got a little way to go on this journey. That's, that's just the reality. As I've been looking at these seven markers of spiritual growth that we're going to look at over these seven weeks, I want to tell, stand here honestly as a pastor and tell you this. I need to grow in all seven. I do. I have not mastered any of them. I, God is still growing me to be more like Jesus. And in each of these characteristics we're going to talk about today, I need to grow in all of those too. We're not there yet. And the beauty is we don't have to be perfect, but we're still on that journey of becoming more like Jesus, moving forward, growing. But we have to take it seriously. And that means slowing down and measuring and looking at things honestly. Why should we grow in Christ-like character? Here's another reason. Because, we, because what we believe and how we live must match up. What we believe and how we live we can't have this radical discontinuity, this fragmentation. But if I say, this is what I believe as a Christian, and my life looks radically different, something's wrong. I need to grow in maturity because what I believe and what I'm called to and how I live don't always line up, but I'm, moving, I'm striving for this, this kind of unification of what I believe and how I live, and that's a journey of growth. God wants this for us. God calls us to this integrated, I know what I believe, but my life is looking more and more like what it is that this book, the Bible, the Word of God, teaches me about how I'm supposed to live my life. And I discovered as a young boy the radical difference between a person who follows all the religious stuff and lives with the character of Jesus and someone who follows all the religious stuff and doesn't live with the character of Jesus. Before I even knew what was going on, I, was, I, was a, I think I was probably like six, seven, eight years old, little boy, we had a babysitter. And this family, they were committed Christians. And the husband and wife were identical in, in their kind of how they lived their Christian life. They both went to church regularly. They both, she served, I think, in children's ministry, and he served in the choir. He was in the choir, so he was on the worship team. They, they gave, they read their Bibles, they prayed. I mean, they did all the stuff that, well, that's what a good Christian does. And they both did all those things. But who they were were radically different people. The wife, I would say, made me think of honey. There was a sweetness to who she was. She was loving, she was gentle, she was patient. I was a tough kid. And she was just, on, just patient with me over and over again. She expressed love to me, her love and the love of God. And there was just a sweetness to who she was. Now she went to church, she read her Bible, she prayed, she gave, she served, all those things. But she also had character that was, there was a sense that she looked like and was becoming like Jesus. Her husband, another story. Her husband, I, I've got a, a can of vegetables with lima beans. Um, <laughs> her husband makes me think of lima beans. Now, those of you that are in the ag industry, everyone loves lima beans, go buy lima beans. Okay, there's your commercial. So I'm not against lima beans, but for me as a kid, um, I wasn't a fan of lima beans. And I remember 
when this man would come into the home, and he, she was there most of the time, he'd come in occasionally. When he walked in the home, his kids, his wife, everyone got tense. And, and as a kid, I, I actually started thinking, it seems like they're afraid of him. But he, he you know, I, didn't, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't go, up and go, to the church, go into church when I was growing up, but they were good you know, Christian people. They went to church, all these things. But then it seemed like everyone was afraid of him, including his wife. And, and it really was strange. He would put on a white glove, literally put on a white glove and like put his finger across the top of the door jam. And if there was dust, he'd yell. I mean, he inspected the house. It was, it was, it was, as a kid, this, this was strange. And my real encounter came with him one day at lunchtime. He was home for a lunchtime. He usually wasn't there, but this day he was home for lunch. And I remember sitting across the table. And there were other kids and she was serving and there were other kids at the table and he was on this end and I was on this end. I can remember like it was yesterday. And I was eating the food on my plate, but there also happened to be lima beans. So I finished everything except the lima beans. And he looked across the table and he saw that and he said, finish your lima beans. So I kind of poked him and prodded him and I just hope he'd go away and forget, but he wasn't that kind of person. So he said again, finish your lima beans. And I dared to speak a single syllable, two letter word to this man. I said, no. And as fast as you could imagine, he was out of his chair across the table, and the next thing I knew, I was pinned on the linoleum floor with him sitting on top of me with my arms pinned down with his knees. He reached over and grabbed the lima beans and began to feed them to me with his thumb, jamming them down my throat. While I heard one of my first sermons ever, he quoted Bible verses about thankfulness. He talked about how ungrateful I was as he was feeding me. Now, I think in today's world, they would call that abuse, and he'd probably get arrested. In those days, it was called babysitting. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it, was a different, it was a different world, right? You didn't, okay, so I'm not, I'm not approving. I'm just saying this. So, I'm, so this happens, and after that, I was, when he walked in the house after that, I was kind of nervous and afraid, too, after that point. But here's what I want you to see. And, and I couldn't, at that time, I couldn't put all the pieces together in my little mind, but I remember the experiences. Now I look back as a Christian, and here's what I realize. Both of these people went to church. Both of them read their Bibles. Both of them said prayers. He would lead us in prayers at the table when he was there. Both of them were serving at their church. Both of them were giving to their church. But there was something different. Character. When the Holy Spirit of God moves into a person's life, they don't just do certain religious tasks. And if what we focus on as a church is just doing certain tasks, but we don't change on the inside... We become what, what Jesus hated the most. The people that Jesus pushed against the hardest were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were incredibly religious. Nobody gave more faithfully than the Pharisees. 10% of everything. They were legalistic about it. No one attended church, the synagogue, regularly like the Pharisees. Nobody knew the Bible like the Pharisees. Nobody knew exactly how to pray on street corners the right way like the Pharisees. But there was something on the inside that wasn't right. And so we're beginning with character because here's what I don't want to see happen. I don't want to see people at shoreline say, okay, I'm picking up all these behaviors and habits and I'm doing all the right religious stuff, but my heart is like what Jesus said about the Pharisees, filled with dead man's bones. There's whitewash and death on the inside. It looks great on the outside, but there's death on the inside. So we're going to begin by looking at what does it mean to have character that looks like Jesus? Because when our character looks like Jesus, we then become sweet as honey and all those other spiritual things we do make sense. But if our character is not becoming like Jesus and the Holy Spirit isn't growing in us, just my picture, it becomes like lima beans. And I still have a, not a good relationship with lima beans to this day. Uh, but, but we want to be those kind of people that reflect the presence of Jesus. Why measure our character, a third reason. Because the deep, deepest longing in the heart of a Christian is to be more like Jesus. I know this about you if you've come to the cross and received Jesus. I know this will be true for you if you one day receive Jesus as your savior and confess your sins and you have his forgiveness. I know this. When the Holy Spirit moves into you, and that's what happens when someone becomes a Christian, you long to be more like Jesus. You hunger for it. So why measure it? Why work at it? Why grow in it? Because it's the desire of our hearts. But it, it means choosing and deciding to grow. Almost nothing good grows by accident. We, 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 we work at it. You know, we're, we're in the egg center of the world. No fields pop up with you know, produce and lines and all ready to go just by accident. It takes intentional work. It takes measurement and time. How deep do you plant the seeds? When do you plant the seeds? How far apart? I mean, all that matters. 
And then you get a produce. Then something grows. If you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we get an answer to the next big question we're going to ask this morning. The what? What do we measure for spiritual growth? You say, well, if we're going to measure our character, give me some things to measure. What do, I, what do I look at in my own life to make sure that it's growing? What do I measure for spiritual growth? And I think the best place to go is, is this Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul lists these nine different characteristics that I believe when you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit moves in you, God plants the seeds. But we get to water the seeds, tend the ground, and help God in the growth process. And we can choose to not grow. And I think a lot of times, that's exactly what we do. We just don't pay any attention to it. We think, well, I'm just going to grow spontaneously. I'll become more mature as a Christian. It doesn't happen. We have to nurture it and tend it and water and work at our spiritual growth. So look with me at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And notice these key nine kind of character-based ideas. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. When I memorized this, it was in the Revised Standard Version. That was patience. But forbearance is patience or hanging in there in tough times. Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If those nine things are growing in your life in an ongoing, consistent measure, you will change your home. You will change your workplace. You will change every place you go. God will work through you in ways that will blow your mind. If you're on an ongoing trajectory of growth in all those areas, then when you read your Bible, when you pray, when you go to church, when you give, all that makes sense. But we've got to get this part right first. And so we've got to say, God, begin to grow in me what you want to, want to see and what you want to see happening. And so with, with the fruit of the Spirit in front of you, and look, look again at that, love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want to give you some good, honest questions you can ask yourself. I think, I think we're wise, if we want to grow to be more who Jesus wants us to be, is to ask ourselves tough questions. Because here's the truth, most of the time other people aren't going to ask us these questions. We choose to grow on our own. We choose to grow in community when we let other people keep, keep us accountable. But rarely does someone come and say, hey, I want to challenge you to grow spiritually. Here's what I'm, I'm going to ask you some tough questions. I'm going to, we are like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, but if we begin to do it in our own lives and invite other people in, it will accelerate our growth. So here's some good questions. Do I love God and people more today than I did six months ago? Ask yourself that. Do, am I becoming more loving toward God and towards people? Because Jesus said that's the most important thing in all the universe. Love God, love people, right? Ask yourself, how am I doing? You might say to yourself, man, I can look back 10 years. I don't love people any more or less than I just, I'm just going through life. Then choose to grow in love and do the things that express love and ask God to guide you on that journey. Here's another question. Am I experiencing real and lasting joy as I walk with Jesus? Do I experience lasting, real, deep joy even when times are tough? In the book of Acts, we see the apostle Paul, this leader in the early church, he gets thrown in jail because he was preaching about Jesus. Well, he gets beat first, then he gets thrown in jail and locked up. And at midnight, he and his, the people that are there with him are in the jail cell singing joyfully to God. I don't know what I'd be doing if I were arrested for preaching Jesus, beat up, and put in chains. I don't know if singing would be the first thing on my mind. Get me a lawyer, I want my phone call, how dare you? That's probably a little more close to how I might respond, and maybe you too. But there's a sense of this, this deep joy, not joy that I'm in jail for the Apostle Paul, but joy that while I'm in jail, Jesus is here, and he's gonna do something. And if you read that story, he did something. God showed up and did an amazing thing that would have never happened had he not ended up in jail. Am I growing in joy in a way that others notice, in a way that I notice? The next question what are signs that my peace and trust in Jesus is increasing with time? Are there signs that, that there's a peace within me? I trust Jesus more than I did before. I'm growing in that. What are signs of that? Ask yourself that question. Am I more patient and long-suffering than I was a year ago? Do I just have this ability to hang in there even when it's tough? Am I, am I not as whiny and complainy, but I just, I've got this strength that says God's on the throne and I'm gonna hang in there and I'm gonna trust God as I go forward? Do people see me as kind even to those who are not? Do people say, oh, she, she's, just, 
She's got such a kindness. Even when other people aren't kind to her, she just kind of overflows with his kindness. Oh, he, he just has a kind heart. We can grow in these things if we choose to, if we're intentional about it. So what's it look like? The where and the when. Seeing spiritual maturity in real life and real time. I want to I think about what does it look like when the fruit of the Spirit are just blossoming and growing in our lives. And again, it's blossoming and growing because we're, we're cultivating it. We're watering it. We're, work, we're aware of it. We're working at it. I want to read the passage again. I want you to read it with me this time. From your Bible, if you have the NIV or up from the screens. Let's read this in unison. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What does that look like in, in just the, the journey of real life? Think about your friendships. Okay, what does joy look like? in your friendships? Do people say, oh, when she walks in the room, when, she's, when I'm around her, there's just a sense of joy. Boy, he brings joy. Do people say that of you? Do you notice that in other people? Sherry and I have some dear friends who are in ministry. We've known them for a long time. And we got to spend time with them recently. They, they live a, a far away from us, so we don't get to see them very often. But when we got with them, we knew they were going through some tough challenges. We knew that there was a situation in their extended family uh, where there was an addiction and some hard things that were happening in the family because of that. And we'd been talking over the phone and praying with them about that. But that was a tough thing in their life. We knew that they took a call to come to a new church. They left where they were, traveled across the country, went to a new church. And they can't find a home that they can afford. And when they bid on a home, somebody outbids them every time. And now it's not just days and weeks. Now it's months going by. And, they still, and all their stuff is in storage. And we know that that's just hard for them. So we know that they're going through it you know, with family and personal life, some tough things. So we get together with them. And when we were with them, did we talk about those challenging things? Yes, we did. And we prayed a couple times about, about family stuff and about church stuff. But there was this sense of joy that came through this husband and wife. And you know what? I, I absolutely expected it because they're mature Christians who know Jesus. But I was still struck by the depth of joy, and we, we laughed together till the, almost to the point of tears. We shared life together. We rejoiced. We shared about fit, the good things that are happening in family and ministry, and we rejoiced, and we felt the presence of Jesus in the midst of all of that, and we talked about sorrow and prayed about the hard things too. But there was joy there. That's maturity. That's spiritual growth. Are you growing to show the joy of Jesus in your friendships, in your relationships, in your home? Is there peace when you walk in the room? When you walk in the room, do things become more peaceful? Or is it like what I felt as a little kid when the dad would walk in the room and everyone just got tense? Are you, are, are, do you, when you come in the house from a long day of work, do you bear the presence of the peace of Jesus? And if you don't, cultivate that. Say, Jesus, I want to be, bring peace into my home. If that means parking in the driveway for 10 or 15 minutes and praying and reading some scriptures and <laughs> breathing, whatever, you know, whatever it takes to just and say, okay, Jesus, I want to go in and, and may I walk into my home with my family and exude the peace of Jesus. That's a choice over and over and over. But it's a growth journey. The Holy Spirit plants the seeds of peace in you but you get to cultivate them and water them and grow them. Be intentional. This is what we're talking about, measuring your spiritual growth. We think about it. We pray about it. We set goals. We work toward these things. And God honors that journey. He partners with us as we partner with him. In your workplace or in your school, do you bring gentleness? Man, we, we live in a time where dialogue, discussion, it's hard to even call it dialogue or discussion anymore. There's just this conflicted kind of head-pounding nature to human communication in our culture that I have never seen in my entire life. There's this level of animosity and antagonism on all these different topics. And, and you know, when, when that, that's going on, are you just, do you just kind of come in and put gas on the fire? Or do you come in with a gentle spirit that, bring, that brings a sense, of, a sense of God's care? Not that you have to agree with everyone. I have you know, strong convictions and strong feelings, but I'm saying, God, help me be gentle as I converse with people. Let me not be that, that source of just that ongoing conflict. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody where we had some disagreement on some things, but it was a, it was a you know, I, I kept saying, Lord, let me just share my heart honestly, but let me be gentle. And God's growing me in that because that, this is one of my biggest growth areas. I need all of these to grow, but gentleness is one of my big ones. And so I, I was saying, Lord, I was actually praying in the midst of this conversation, just give me a gentle spirit. Even though we disagree, I can do it gently. I can do it because somebody in our world's got to, 
have a conversation without screaming at other people. You know, we gotta be able to, to, to show a gentleness and that will show the presence of Jesus. At church, when you come to church, are you showing love, the fruit of the spirit of love? And, and here's the deal. You can show love in hundreds of little ways. You come to second service, which means you might find it challenging to find a parking spot if you're not here early. And so you're in the parking lot. Somebody's helping with parking. Do, do you look at them and say, hey, thanks for serving. God bless you. Or come on, find me a spot. Not that, I mean, not that anyone here would ever do that, but I'm saying other churches. No, um, but no, I mean, that's human nature, right? I mean, do you, do you look and say, God, let me show, here's this person who might be in there, out there, all three services, helping people find a spot to park. How about if I just say, hey, thanks so much for serving. I know you're doing the best you can. And extend the love of Jesus. To give a kind word to our volunteers. When you pick up a, a son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter from the children's programming upstairs, from the, from the, the uh, tide pool over here with the little ones, do you stop and say, I so appreciate you being here and serving our kids. I was able to go and learn from the word and worship, and I couldn't do it without you serving. And if you dare say, man, I love our team here at Shoreline and the way they serve. Thank you so much. You can extend just that little little overture of love. When someone comes in late to church and they have to crawl across your legs to get in for worship, do you smile and say good morning? Or do you like, Ugh. you know, I don't, I'm not a good growler because I never growl, but um, I'm in the front row. Nobody walks across my legs, but, but, you know, but, but do you give a gesture of love or do you kind of scowl? You know, all, all those things add up to, to, to a life that reflects the presence of Jesus. I'll give you a challenge. Try to welcome one other per person you don't know every time you come to Shoreline. Somebody that scares you to death. Well, what if I said, you know, you know hi, I'm so-and-so, and, and, and they say, are, are, you, if say, are you new? And they say, no, I've been coming here for 15 years. I'm going to feel stupid. I don't want to do that. You know what you know, I do with people? I'm the pastor. I'll say to people, hey, I, I, I say, hi, I'm Kevin. I, I'm not sure if we've met. I say, I'm not sure if we've met. Usually, I don't recognize them. Usually, they go, no, we haven't. But, you know, and then we have a little chat. Sometimes they say, oh, yeah, we did meet. I say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Remind me of your name. It's not so hard, right? But it's, it's a human connection. And Shoreline is a, is a big church. It's a growing church. Let's take those little steps to show love and care. All these things are decisions, and they all shape our lives. So the last question, the how. What steps will I take to grow my character to look more and more like Jesus? What steps can I take to, to fulfill this passage? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do I take steps forward? Here's some challenges. Number one, and, and I, I pray all of you will take this challenge. And I'm going to be doing this in the coming week. I'm actually re-memorizing this in the NIV because I memorized in the RSV and, and so a different version. But um, I will commit this passage to memory. I want to challenge you to commit Galatians 5, 22 and 23 to memory. So you have those nine characteristics locked in your mind and locked in your heart. So anytime you can say, boy, as I go into this day, let me show love and peace and joy and, and forbearance. Let me, let me show these things as I live my life. Commit it to memory. Try that. Second, I will celebrate where I see growth in the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I will notice where I'm taking steps forward. And I'll say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're growing me. Thank you that I'm looking and sounding and living more like you, Jesus, my Lord, who gave, you gave your life for me, and I'm trying to become like you, and I see it happening. When you are a little bit more gentle, I felt like yesterday I was more gentle than I would have been if I hadn't been thinking about it. And I was like, that was good. That, I, I'm taking a step forward. I want to keep growing in my faith, and I hope and pray you desire that as well, that you're hungry for that. So celebrate every time you can. Here's a big challenge, and I want to word this the right way. I believe that every single person here could greatly benefit if you would do this. I will ask people I respect how I am doing and growing and exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. And I'll listen. I actually did this by writing a little note that I, I actually put in about 10 mailboxes already. And I've got three more to hand out. One to my wife and two to two friends of mine that I know will be honest with me. And actually, we're going to put this note on the website so if you, without the names, and you can just take this note and use it if you want to print this out and give it to a few people or email it to someone. And so here's what I wrote. And this is actually the one I'm giving to Sherry after the service. And I just ask you, please be honest with me, honey. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> if you know my wife, you know she'll be honest with me. Um, gently but honest. 
Sherry, I am seeking to become more like Jesus and a better person to everyone in my life. With this in mind, I am asking you to do me a huge favor. Will you look over the nine characteristics below, and I have them all listed right here, and the nine characteristics below, and answer two questions for me. Number one, which characteristic do you see growing in me? And feel free to give an example if you have one. So share something you see growing, and that's something positive. Second, what is one characteristic you think I need to develop and grow in my life? Feel free to share an example of what this might look like in my relationship with you or others. I, I want to hear from godly people who I respect. If you give this to a person who's not a Christian, you ask them to share with you. Uh, they might say, where'd you come up with those nine things? You say, oh, it's actually from a passage in the Bible. It might have a chance to talk about what you learned from the Bible. And then I just put it at the end. I listed the nine characteristics. And I said, I would appreciate your wisdom and also your prayers as I seek to become more like Jesus and honor him in my life. I, I'm looking forward to, with a little fear and trepidation, but I'm looking forward to the feedback from these people. And here's the thing. If, if half of them say, boy, the area you really need to grow is this one, that will speak to my heart. And I need to go into it not defensive, but, but here's the bottom line. I want to be more like Jesus. Don't you? Don't you want to be more like Jesus? Then let's take it seriously. Let's go after this. Let's grow. Let's be intentional. Let's ask the right people the right questions. And then finally, I will set personal goals to accelerate my growth in the areas I see that I'm the weakest. I'll actually look at my life and I'll set goals. If I say, boy, gentleness and kindness are areas I need to grow. I'm gonna, and here's the thing. I can't up, stand up here and tell you what it looks like in your life because I don't live your life. But you can. If you say, boy, I need to be more gentle with my friends, with my parents, with my siblings, with my boss, with my neighbors, you just write down three or four ways that, that you need to be gentle. You'll know. You're, if you're smart enough to hear what I'm talking about right now, you can do this. And then you say, God, help me, and you work at those things. And when you stumble and fall, you say, God, forgive me. You get up, and you keep working at it. And here's what happens. You begin to see more and more of the fruit of the Spirit growing in you. And then... When we talk about all the other things for spiritual growth, if the character of Jesus is growing in us, I, I want to look like that babysitter who was kind and gentle and tender and loving, and also she loved Jesus, and she went to church, and she prayed, and she read her Bible, but it transformed her. I don't want to be like a can of lima beans, and again, I'm not against lima beans, but I'm saying um, I, I, I want to I know that when my character reflects Jesus, then all the other parts of my spiritual life make sense. This is why we're starting here. And I want to pray with you and ask that God would move in your life. And you would dare to look at your spiritual life and look at these nine characteristics. Commit this passage to memory and say, God, I want to find those ones that I'm doing well in. I want to celebrate. And I want to acknowledge those areas I need to grow. And I'm going to set goals and have people keep me accountable. And I want to be more like Jesus. Lord, this is our prayer. This is our prayer this morning as we're together here in this room in the family worship venue online. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your call to spiritual growth. And we pray, Lord, that our character, our hearts, our lives will be shaped by Jesus because the Holy Spirit of Jesus lives in us that, we will, that these nine characteristics will become who we are in growing measure. And when we stumble, let us get up and press on. And when we do well, let us rejoice. Let us cheer each other on to become more like Jesus. And oh God, as these characteristics grow in us, all the rest of our spiritual life will make so much more sense. So grow in us the fruit of the Spirit and help us become more and more like Jesus with each moment of each passing day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.